ago when I started working here, uh, a conspicuous absence in our collection was a P-51 Mustang. Um, you know, our organization's collection has grown opportunistically over the years and we haven't always had a large budget. And, you know, the World War II fighters are always in, in high demand with people with uh, greater resources than most museums. So uh, we had an opportunity in the, in the early 2000s to acquire the basics of a P-51 Mustang restoration project, which ultimately became the airplane behind us here. Uh, we fabricated a lot of parts and pieces here. I bought a lot of new build stuff from Warbird suppliers. We traded for non-flyable material. So it's probably about 50% original parts and components from many, many different aircraft. And everything that we weren't able to buy or acquire, we fabricated here. So again, we were left with this conundrum. Well, how do we represent it? Um, the 8th Air Force and the 9th Air Force uh, is disproportionately represented in the Mustang community. So um, being slightly contrarian in nature here, we thought, well, what can we do to you know, play to our strengths? And one of the strengths we have here is uh, our extensive uh, Pacific theater collection from World War II, the vast majority of which these aircraft all have operational service. So. Um, we looked at, we were looking around for an interesting story to tell that hadn't been picked up before and it didn't take us long to come across the uh, story of uh, Lieutenant Lou Curtis and I'll let Andrew talk sure. about Lou's career. So he's again another one of those interesting guys. So you look at the scorecard on the side of the airplane. I mean you'll notice German, Italian and Japanese. We'll save the obvious at the end. But So he flew in the Mediterranean for at least one tour, I believe, flying P-38s. P-38s, yeah. um, And he actually even got shot down, became a POW, but was either escaped... He escaped from the camp. Uh, he escaped from the camp, right. Yeah. Which is why he got sent to the Pacific. Right, right, right. because yeah. once you get shot down in a theater, you're usually not allowed to, you know... If you fly again. Fly again, yeah. right, because you, you don't want to get torture giving away who helped you escape, all yeah, that kind of yeah. stuff. So he ended up in the Pacific and he ended up in the third air commando group, which in of itself is interesting. It was an interesting composite group, usually of a fighter squadron, of a B-25 squadron, and an l -bird squadron. And the ideas were that they were gonna be forward deployed, helping troops and often commando units and stuff. Like, you know, in the, there was one in India as well that was kind of dealing with the India, Burma, and Merrill's Marauders. So, how did he end up with an American, an official American kill? Well, one day he was out in his flight flying and saw a C-47 that was landing in Baton Island near the Philippines, which at that point had not been um, liberated, liberated the by, yeah. by yeah. the Allies yeah. or the Americans. Yeah. yeah, the C-47 crew was actually off course. They thought they were a little bit further south. Right. They had to lined up on a very similar looking island. Right, and he recognized, well, if they land on a Japanese held island, it's not going to go well for them. So he tried to get, you know, their attention, but, you know, it's not like the movies. Everyone's radio sets did not communicate with each other. So he's, you know, waggling his wings, doing all this stuff, and they yeah, are just... Buzzing the C-47, they're giving him the finger. Right, or, they're, just, they're just ignoring, <laughs> ignoring him. him. So the only option he had was, well, what if I damage their engines enough that they end up having to ditch in the water? And that's exactly what he did. He yeah. very surgically shot up some of the engines and the aircraft ditched. He remained on cap for a while until like Dumbo, squat, Dumbo showed up in an air sea rescue and got all them out. And it turned out that it was actually medical staff. It was doctors and nurses, which would have been, you know, an, even doubly disastrous. E double disasters. So, yeah. Yeah. Um, you know, so yeah. And yeah. he officially was awarded American, an American kill. But Scott was going to point out another thing that was interesting. We painted this aircraft and all the model kits and all everything, the books. yep, had a yellow spinner on it. So, of course, we do that. And kid you not, about a month later on. Um, Critical Pass. Critical Pass, who has, who's been digitizing all the National Archives, says, shows Curtis in his P-51 with a red spinner. Luckily, it was easy enough to just take the spinner yeah. off and repaint it. Because it was a color film that they had Yes, shot, right? yes. Yeah. And the other thing, too, is in, you know, that was not common because this group is notoriously hard to, to, document. to document. You look in these really detailed books on 5th Air Force and Pacific uh, units, this one, it's all over the place. You know, they're not really sure, 
if the colors on the spinners represented flights within the squadron or what. So, yep. it, it, but luckily, again, it was yep. just a spinner. We had to pop it off, repaint it, not yep. have to take the aircraft back exactly. and repaint yep. the whole thing. And his ultimate victory of the war, it turns out one of the nurses on the aircraft later became his girlfriend and wife, and she died about 10 years ago. We got to speak with her briefly before for her passing away. <laughs>